Today we're going to actually introduce chapters 12, 13, and 14 by looking at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And uh, these chapters deal with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do today is simply give you an introduction by looking at the first three verses. And this is an introduction foundation for the rest of the teachings that we're going to be looking at as we go through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I'll begin at verse 1, read to verse 3, introduce our subject, lay a foundation, and move into verses 1 through 3. And that will actually be the foundation for the time that we come after that to look at the diversities of gifts and all of that, which is to me a very important, important uh, message and series for this time in the history of the church. But beginning at verse 1, going to verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, as we begin, let me lay a foundation for you so that we can see a few things and begin to lay, as I said, a context. When we enter into chapter 12, notice how he begins, how he begins by saying, now concerning spiritual gifts. Paul is actually continuing a formula, a formula that relates to answering questions that he'd used already in chapter 7, verse 1, as well as chapter 8, verse 1. He had, he had stated, for example, that, and well, I might as well turn you to those and I'll show you. He had stated this in order to lay a foundation to answer the question. So he had said in chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So they had, had, had asked questions related to marriage and all, but he starts his formula of explaining or answering that question by saying, saying now concerning. Then in chapter 8, he answered another one of their questions where he said, now concerning things offered to idols. So when you get into chapter 12, verse 1, he's simply using the same formula for answering their questions. And now what he's going to do is he's going to begin to answer their question concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Notice how he says in verse 1, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, if you look at your uh, your your Bible and look at verse 1, I want you to notice that the word gifts is italicized. That simply means that the word gifts was not in the original Greek language. The literal translation is simply concerning spirituals. But the church has always regarded these spirituals as spiritual gifts. And so he's speaking concerning what are called the spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are specifically the supernatural gifts bestowed on the church by the Spirit of God. Now, in order to develop this, because we're going to look at each one of these gifts individually as we continue on through this chapter and into chapter 14, but in order to, to get an idea of how we're going to be able to interpret and apply this, we need to remember that the church, the church is not simply a humanly powered organization. The church is not like a fraternal organization, or an athletic organization. It is not like a, a union or any other man-made and man-energized organization. The church is an organization, but it is what is called an organized organism, meaning that the body of Christ is alive. And so though we are organized, we are not simply a man-made organization, but we are a supernaturally gifted group of individuals. We have, in other words, when we received Christ, received from Him gifts that are supernatural in origin. And so this is a supernaturally empowered organism called the church, and the power that energizes the church comes from God. In this chapter, Paul is going to introduce the variety of spiritual gifts, and we're going to see how the Holy Spirit gifts the church, and we're going to look at a short list of the gifts that He has for us in 1 Corinthians. Now, I believe it's an important study because I think that this right now is a critical issue. 
I've discovered, and some of you have too, I'm sure, that many Christians live a lackluster, defeated spiritual life. And I believe that part of the reason is, is because they have little or no understanding of the power and the gifting of the Spirit of God. Now, over the centuries, the church seems to have taken one, or, or one of two avenues in regards to the Holy Spirit. Either the church has quenched the Holy Spirit, or the church has grieved the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul has issued warnings concerning both of these sins against the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, he said, quench not the Spirit. When he said, quench not the Spirit, he's saying, do not put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Or we have, if not quenching it, we certainly have grieved the Holy Spirit's work because he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Quench not the Spirit and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Either the church is busy quenching the Spirit or the church very often is busy grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, it seems to me that we're usually doing one or the other. We quench the Holy Spirit when we attempt to do spiritual things with fleshly methods. We can quench the Holy Spirit by developing doctrines that eliminate His work in our day. I was having a conversation after one of our services this morning. A brother who's been in our fellowship for many years asked me a question related to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. He mentioned a certain well-known author whom I have met and spoken to and have, and have known uh, for a long time. And uh, he mentioned his writings and all, and, and I was sharing with him concerning the fact that he's a marvelous, marvelous teacher, one of the finest teachers. But he and I had a conversation on one occasion where he said that he had recently written a book. And he said, and you Calvary chapels will agree with about 80% of what I've written. And it was a book related to the working of the Holy Spirit because he's party to a particular doctrinal persuasion that believes that the Lord does not gift the church in our present day the way that the church was gifted in its birth. And so he believes that the gift of tongues is the ability to learn foreign languages. He believes that the gift of knowledge is the ability to go to school and, and to receive advanced degrees. That prophecy is simply the preaching of the Word of God and things of that nature. And so what he has done is he has naturalized the gifts of the Spirit to make them into gifts that anybody could really have because there are quite a number of people who are able to learn foreign languages or to obtain advanced degrees. When we look at those gifts, we're going to see that those are supernatural gifts and not gifts that you just obtain through effort or through life's experience. But the church has developed doctrines that basically quench the Holy Spirit. Much of what comes into today's theology as it relates to the working and gifting of the Holy Spirit comes from the writings of a, a writer by the name of B.B. Warfield. And some of you perhaps are familiar with his writings. He wrote in the 1800s and he basically said that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased with the death of the last apostle. And in essence was saying that the, the gifts of the Spirit were bestowed by the laying on of hands of apostles. And when, one, when the final apostle died, that there is no longer anything that is really close to being what is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's no need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our day. The problem with that, and there are many problems with that, but one of the problems with that is that they're failing to remember that the apostles were not the, the ones who baptized with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said, there's one who comes after me. He said, I'm not worthy even to untie or carry his shoes. This is the one who baptizes you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit baptizer is not the apostle. The Holy Spirit baptizer is Jesus Christ. And Jesus still pours out his spirit on the church. But there are doctrines that are are built on a belief that, that no longer does the uh, Holy Spirit work in such a way. And so we can quench the Spirit by developing doctrines that eliminate His work in our day. We can quench the Spirit by trusting our own preparation and experience. When you have a um, seminary degree, which I think is a wonderful thing to have, I, I certainly don't knock those who have become well-educated, uh, but when you have one, one of the dangers is that you can begin to rely on, on all the things that you've been taught by your professors and the experience that you gain through your personal endeavors and your, your, your personal uh, building of the church and learning through your personal experiences and all. 
And on one occasion, many years ago now, I was, I was speaking to my pastor, Chuck, Chuck Smith, and, and I asked him concerning um, going to seminary, and I asked him, how do you feel about that? Because I know Chuck has received his degree and, and all, and I just wanted to hear his, his point. And he said, there's nothing wrong with it. He says, the one thing that concerns me, though, is when uh, the Calvary guys get their degrees, he said, there's a tendency on the part of the seminaries that, that handed them their diploma to begin to take credit for the work that was done in the ministry of that individual, and they begin to basically take the glory that really belongs to God. And in some ways, that, that does happen. That uh, person has got a huge church, and he's making a, a huge impact, and before you know it, seminaries want to associate with him and say that we are the ones who are responsible because we trained him in his theology and we prepared him for his ministry. And so sometimes when somebody gets a degree, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a degree that can be very helpful, but sometimes when we receive our degrees, uh, we can begin to think that we have become the individuals who, uh, through our experience, were able to produce a wonderful work, a uh, powerful spirit-led church. Many years ago now, when our church was just a few months old, it was less than a year old, I, I went to visit one of my former uh, college professors, Dr. Moore, and he was a very special professor to me, and, and I had uh, sat under him when I was at Biola. And so uh, he knew that I had planted a church. I had actually asked him to perform the wedding for Marie and me. Uh, I loved him that much. He was unable to do it. wasn't licensed at that time, but... That's how much I loved him. And so I went to see him, and I said, uh, I'd like to talk to you and share with you because the Lord has um, given me opportunity to plant a church. And so he was still a professor at Biola at that time, and, and so he said, why don't you come and have lunch? So I did, and I remember showing up at, at Biola's campus, and we went into the cafeteria, and, and we sat down, and we began to uh, pray to share uh, over a meal. and. Um, I had been reading books, and the church was about, about uh, a little bit less than a year old at that time, and, and he said to me, he said, David, he goes, the church is growing. Can you tell me why? You know, what's going on? And it's one of those, you know, friendly kind of conversations. Well, I had read five books, you know, on church growth methodology, and he was a church growth specialist. And so I began to answer, well, you know, and I, there were seven or there were eight principles that I began to answer because I knew the principles and I kind of figured he wanted to hear that as an answer. I'll never forget this. I started to answer when he said, oh, just a minute. He goes, I have to go get something else. I forgot it. Uh, I'll be right back and then you can tell me. When he got up and walked away, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said, you better not take the glory or I'll take my hand off of you. I'll never forget that. So he comes walking back and sits down and he puts his plate in front of himself and he says, so David, tell me, why is the church growing? And I smiled at him and I said, I don't know. I haven't got a clue why the, why the church is growing. I said, it's just one of those things that God does to get all the glory. Man, I am not going to touch the glory. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will give to no one else, neither my praise to graven images. And so the Lord said, you better not touch the glory, son, or I'll take your hands off. I'll never forget that. And so we have to be careful that we do not take the glory for the work that, that is being done. And, and unfortunately, one of the ways you quench the Holy Spirit is by trusting in your own preparation and your own experience. We can also quench the Holy Spirit by trusting in techniques to get people into the doors of our churches. The techniques... Now, when you look at the life of John the Baptist, there are certain things you can see in Luke chapter 1 concerning him. He had godly parents. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. A variety of things that you can see concerning him that were qualities in this man's life. And yet, he was one who was out in a wilderness, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness doing ministry, and the Bible says to us that the people were coming to him. So all of these people are arriving, so many that even when Jesus himself went to John to be baptized, John's 
uh, rather Jesus' disciples, no, rather John's disciples got upset because Jesus' ministry was taken off and John's ministry was now re receding. And, and, and so his disciples say to him, they say to John, the one whom you baptized, the one that you gave testimony to, he's now doing a greater work than you. And that's when John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. What made his ministry powerful out there in the wilderness was the knowledge that it centers on who Jesus Christ is. And unless we understand that, unless we understand that, that any ministry success that we might see is going to always be because the hand of God is upon that ministry, then we're going to start taking once again the glory for that work. He must increase so we can quench him by trusting techniques to get people into the doors of our churches. That's something that I want to be very sensitive to. We're going to have, uh, as you know, uh, uh, a concert next, next week. It's not just so that the church can get together and party. It's so that we can glorify Jesus Christ. That's why we do these things. And that's why I have certain guest speakers come in. And that's why I do what I want. It's not so that we can fill the place up with bodies. It's so that we can fill those bodies up with the Spirit. And that's what we want to do, you see? And so we have to be careful about that. And so we can sometimes design church services to make Jesus acceptable to the sinner. We don't want to speak concerning anything that might bring conviction because, after all, they may not come back again. So we have to be aware of that. We want the world to come to us sometimes, so we encourage comfort at the expense of conviction. But Oswald Chambers once said, we must never confuse our desire for people to accept the gospel with creating a gospel that is acceptable to people. And so we need to preach the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and, and we must not focus on making goats more comfortable in church. They need, to, they need to hear the truth because it's the truth that sets them free. Now, if we're not busy quenching the Holy Spirit, well, we can often be guilty of grieving the Holy Spirit. And that occurs through the excesses that are often attributed to the working of the Holy Spirit. And in some places, experience becomes the rule of thumb. It wasn't that long ago, and I'm certain that you still see these kinds of things in some places, but it wasn't that long ago that people would go to church and, and somebody would say that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they would begin to bark like a dog. Did any of you remember that? It wasn't that long ago. Raise your hand if you, if you know what I, Yeah, okay. A lot of you don't know. There were experiences going on in churches not that long ago where the people were showing up and they were rolling on the carpets they were they were they were doing things in excess they were running around the church during the services saying the holy spirit was on them making them do that they had a laughing fit you know where they would fall and convulse on the ground roll around those are the kinds of things that are the works of the flesh and I often found those interesting and sometimes tried to find some humor in it. I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. What if the husband barks and the wife meows? <laughs> now, wow, that will be an interesting. <laughs> so when the flesh gets in the way, remember always this. This is a very simple thing. Jesus had the fullness of the spirit, and he is the most normal human being who ever lived. When he spoke, he didn't start to suddenly quiver, shake, sweat, grab a handkerchief, roll, bark, meow. He didn't do any of that. Keep that in mind because these excesses are not to be attributed to the working of the Holy Spirit. Those are called excesses of the flesh. It's the flesh wanting dominance because the Holy Spirit has come not to bring glory to himself, but to reveal Jesus, who reveals God to you. And that's the sequence. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to bring you to Jesus, who presents you to the Father. So the Holy Spirit doesn't work in such a way as to bring glory to you. And people um, will say Calvary chapels quench the Holy Spirit. I, I just had somebody tell me that this week. That the whole night. Calvary chapels quench the Holy Spirit. And I said, really? Because we don't 
allow people to just get up and run around the church service, you know, because the spirit's on them. You know, I've had people do that before. Um, I've had people, I've watched them as they start edging out into the aisle with their tambourines, you know, you know, and I have an usher standing there edging them back in, you know. <laughs> oh, you're quenching the spirit. Well, I, uh, maybe I am. Maybe I'm just so carnal that, that when I'm worshiping Jesus and somebody's standing in front of me and they're moving around, maybe I'm so carnal that, that I notice that person and I can't see Jesus anymore. That's one of the reasons why if we stand, we all stand. If we're seated, we're all seated. Because that way it's called decently and in order. That way nobody's being distracted by somebody else. And I have discovered the flesh being what it is that sometimes people do enjoy that attention that they receive as they stand there doing the holy, you know, hokey pokey in front of the church, you know. And so from my perspective, we need to make sure that the one who gets the glory is the one who deserves it. And so in the excess of the flesh, what happens is the spirit is actually being grieved by, by our um, acting out in the fashion that we do. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, we read, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, You men of Judea and all of you who dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What he was doing is he was explaining a supernatural event when the day of Pentecost had fully arrived, the Holy Spirit rested on the 120 there in the upper room, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they poured out of that upper room there in Jerusalem and began to speak in languages that were unlearned, magnifying God. And when they did that, the people who were around there at that time, seeing this take place, began to mock them and say, these men are filled with new wine. And the reason that the apostle Peter got up and addressed it is because he was saying, this is not what you think. These men are not drunken as you suppose. It's too early in the morning. The bars haven't opened up. So these people are not drunken, but this is that. And this is how you deal, by the way, with supernatural experiences. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In other words, for a spiritual experience, there needs to be a scriptural reasoning. So he said, this is the fulfillment of what Joel had prophesied concerning your sons and daughters who would prophesy. And so he was saying, this is the fulfillment of the promise that was made by the Father that Jesus spoke about, and it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Now, these two extremes generally are enough to keep people from seeking to understand their gifts. On the one hand, some think that I don't really have a gift. There are only certain special people in the church who do. And on the other hand, when you see somebody in excess of the flesh acting things out, they say, I don't want anything like that at all in my life. It's too scary and weird. My mom and my dad, many years ago, were in the city of Ontario driving. They were on Euclid. And a young woman came running from the, a side street out to their car at the light and started banging on the, my mom's window. My mom got startled, and she's saying, help me, help me, give me a ride, get me out of here. So my mom and dad, thinking that somebody was attacking her, my mom opens the door, and the little girl, young woman jumps into the back seat and says, get me out of here. My mom says, they drove through the green light, and my mom turns and said, what happened, what's wrong? She says, I was just in a church right there. This is a true story. <laughs> and they were screaming and running around and rolling. She said, it scared me, she scared me. Now my mom says to me, she says, Dave, I didn't want to tell her that we're one of those. <laughs> we're believers too. But see, that's what happens. She was so scared at what she saw. She thought they were mad. We're going to see that Paul actually speaks like that later on. People are going to think you're mad because the flesh, when it acts out, what the flesh can act out, well, some people can think that if you're acting out in the flesh that you have to be crazy. One of the things about being enamored with the supernatural is that those who are enamored with the supernatural focus on the gifts rather than the giver. And so... 
We need to understand that God wants to pour His Spirit into our lives, not just so that we can have the gifts of the Spirit, but so that we might be more like Him and minister to people in His power. We need to remember James 1.17, which says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We don't want to focus on the gift. There have been many people, perhaps I have some in this room right now, who have focused on the gifts. I want this gift, this gift. I have to have this gift. Normally the gift that people will focus on is the gift of tongues. That's normally the gift that people will focus on. I want to speak in tongues. There are some who would teach, and we're going to give you a thorough teaching on all of this, but there are some who would teach that the gift of tongues is the primary evidence that you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so there's been a focus on one particular gift. I see the gifts differently, and I'll show you why as we go through the gifts of the Spirit through the next uh, few weeks. But the gifts of the Spirit, the, the gifts of the Spirit are given to you as God desires. So it doesn't really matter how much I beg for a certain gift. It's up to the Lord to give the gifts as He wills. He distributes as He wills. I can ask, but the Lord will give the gift that He wants me to have. And so you'll see that. But there are so many times that people want the gifts of the Spirit, certain gifts. What I want to do is receive whatever it is that He has for me. Well, believers need to have a knowledge of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says to us in verse 1, Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Anybody here feel flattered by the word ignorant? You know, how you doing, ignorant? I, I, that's an insult, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I remember, <laughs> let me share something with you. I, I remember I was sharing with somebody one time many years ago, a dear friend of mine, and they said something, and I said, that's because you're ignorant. Well, they got mad for some reason. Uh, I, and, oh, they did, they did. How could you call me ignorant? I said, no, wait a minute, stupid. No, I didn't. I'm teasing. I'm just getting carried away. It's the flesh, forgive me. It's not the anointing. I said, forgive me. I didn't intend to insult you. Do you know what the word ignorant means? You don't because you're ignorant. No, you don't. The word, the word ignorant means literally without knowledge. That's what it means. So all he's saying is, I don't want you to be uninstructed. I don't want you to be without knowledge. It's not an insult at all. It's actually an encouragement. Concerning spirituals, I don't want you to be uninstructed is what he's saying. So he's not saying, I don't want you to walk around like a bunch of intellectual hillbillies. I, I, I don't want you to walk around. And that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I don't want you in this area to be without spiritual understanding. And that's the whole point of chapter 12, is to give them understanding because he wants them to mature. He wants to provoke them to maturity in the things of the Lord. He wants them to be well instructed. In Ephesians, in chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, Paul said it like this. He said, it, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. I don't want you to be uninstructed, I want you to mature. I want you to grow up in Christ, he's saying, to be mature in the things of the Lord. I want you to be fully mature in your understanding. And so as he's saying that, I don't want you to be ignorant, he says, verse 2, you know 
that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. And so he says you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. Now, when he speaks of Gentiles in the, uh, in the Old Testament, you have the division of humanity where it's Jew and Gentile. So that's basically humanity. It doesn't have a lot of, of uh, hyphenated people groups. It's basically Jew and it's Gentile. If you're not of the people of Israel, then you are automatically in the Old Testament, you are a Gentile. The Gentiles and the Jews, when spoken of in the New Testament, very often are spoken of in this way. The Jews are those who received what are called the oracles or the word of God. They received the priesthood. They had the prophets. They have a variety of things that were given to them as a nation because they're the covenant people of God. But the Gentiles are without that. They don't have the priesthood. They don't have the prophets. They don't have the visions, the miracles, and all of those things. And so the scripture will refer to them very often as being without God in the world. You see, they're separated from God because they don't have a relationship with Him. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 says it like this. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So Gentiles were without Christ, without hope, they were without God in the world. And that's because God had a special relationship with the nation of Israel. In the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 2, God says this. He says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. In Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, those verses refer to those who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption and the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So Gentiles were foreigners of the promise. They were without hope. They were without God. And as a result, and that's what he's speaking about in verse 2, they were carried away to these dumb idols. Now, when you read the word dumb idols, I mean, it's not the words that we usually say, man, don't be so dumb. I got a story. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you it. It makes me laugh. I, mean, I, I, I better not. I, but anyway, I'll laugh to myself. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep going. <laughs> dumb idols. You see, <laughs> it still makes me laugh. I, I wish I could tell you, but I won't. Um, it's unspeaking. When, when an idol is referred to as a dumb idol, it's not like he's saying those dumb idols, you know, those, those dumb Bruins, you know. He's saying those unspeaking idols. That's what he's referring to. You were carried away. The word carried away means to be led away. It's, it was used especially of those who are led off to trial, prison, or punishment. And so often these false gods represented by idols had priests who professed to speak under the influence of the spirit of the God, and they would lead people astray. They have some show on where some woman claims to be a psychic. And she walks around and she has, she burns incense and she, you know, she says she's channeling and this and that, you know. And they, they say that they're being, uh, that they are channeling spirits or speaking on the influence of something else, right? And that's kind of what happened. Oh, that's what happened uh, thousands of years ago. That's, they're, they're just people who are leading others astray by those kinds of things. And so he's saying, before you were saved, you were pathetic prisoners taken captive by non-living idols non-living idols, dumb idols. It's like what it says in Psalm 130, 135, verses 15 through 18, uh, where, where the psalmist said, the idols of the nations are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Nor is there breath in their mouths. And those who make them will be like them, 
and so will all who trust in them. They're dead. They have no life. They can't help you. They're just carved by men's hands. Isaiah speaks and says that a man goes out to the woods and he cuts down a tree and with some of the, the wood, he, he builds himself a fire and, and he cooks his food on it. And, and the other portion of the tree, he carves it into an idol and he places it in a, in a prominent place in the house and, and he bows down and he worships it and he says, you are my God. And, and the point he's making is, how ridiculous is this? With part of the tree, you burn it so that you can eat and the other part of the tree, you worship it. And he said, that is a ridiculous thing. Well, that's exactly what is ridiculous about idolatry. And that's what he's saying. You were carried away and were prisoners to sin because you didn't have a relationship with God. And therefore, you created your own God. And you became like the God that you created. Dead. Because they have no life. And so they may have eyes. And they may have ears. They may have mouths. They may have a nose. They may have a throat. They may have hands and feet. But they can't save. And he said, you were carried away. He said, and therefore, you have been set free, and you need to understand that God is the living God. Verse 3, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. As a young believer... I had someone speaking to me on one occasion who knew that I am a charismatic. Charismatic means I believe in the continuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God still baptizes. You'll see this if you hang around through this study. That God baptizes with the Holy Spirit, empowers with the Holy Spirit, gifts with the Holy Spirit. They have not ceased with the death of the last apostle. They continue to be in the church to this day. A lot of people, as I said earlier, have been turned off by it, by the excesses of the flesh that they've seen, and they've, they've backed away because they're afraid that they're going to act in, in an odd fashion the way that they see others, and so they don't want anything to do with this. And I think that's been one of the, the schemes of the enemy, is to quench the Holy Spirit from working in the body of Christ through the fear of the people because they're afraid that the Spirit's going to make them do something weird. And in reality, he makes you normal. But I've had people say to me in the past, well, I was listening to somebody speak in an unlearned language. And there was somebody in the room who understood that language because it was an actual language. And it turns out that that person speaking in that language was cursing God. And I've heard that. Some of you, has anybody here in this room ever heard that? Raise your hand if you have. If there's one or two, there's a few of you. No, that was very common. I heard that when I was first saved. It was one of the ways to, to, to tell people like me, don't expect the Lord to give you an unlearned language. No, don't, don't, don't look in that direction because you may end up cursing God. Well, Paul's answer to that, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. So the Holy Spirit is not going to prompt you to say anything of Jesus being worthless. And so the point he's making is, that a spiritual person will be known by the things that they say. And that should be fairly obvious, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 1914 said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Ephesians 5, 3 and 4 says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. See, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when the Holy Spirit is moving in you, you're going to be praising Him. That's how you got saved. No one calls Jesus Lord but by the Holy Spirit. A genuine believer moved by the Spirit of God will never call Jesus accursed. That word accursed is interesting. Let me give you a little insight into that word. The word is anathema. And all of us believers who've been around for a while have heard that word, anathema. Let them be anathema. The word anathema speaks of accursed. Um, but originally, it, it speaks of an offering that resulted from a vow, which after being consecrated to a god, 
was hung upon the walls or columns of the temple or put in some other conspicuous place. It speaks of something devoted to God without hope of being redeemed. And so the point is, since it has been given to God, it is as good as destroyed and therefore is no longer yours. So in this context, Jesus re being referred to as worthless or doomed to destruction and rejected by God is something you would never say because you serve the living God and you do not consider him worthless. So calling Jesus accursed is saying he's worthless and God's Holy Spirit would never lead you to say that. No one can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The words Jesus is Lord can only have full meaning when under the Spirit's influence. There are times in certain church groups where at a certain age, a young person in the church will stand in front of the church, perhaps you came from this tradition, and at a certain age, usually it's 12 or 13, and they'll stand in front of the church on a, on a service where the body of Christ is there, and they will stand up and say, Jesus is Lord. When they say that, they're making a confession of faith before the people and are accepted as a member, a full member of the church. And the reason that they say that Jesus is Lord is because Paul said you can't call Jesus Lord but by the Spirit. But once again, that is ritualizing something. Just because somebody says Jesus is Lord doesn't mean that Jesus is their Lord. Jesus becomes your Lord when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and righteousness and judgment. When you confess your sin, God, forgive me a sinner, and come into my life and make me a new creation because I want old things to pass away and all things to become new. God, I want to become the temple of the Spirit of God, and I want you to dwell within me, and I know my sin has blocked that. And so I confess and I forsake my sin, and I ask you to forgive me and come into my life by faith. I ask you to dwell within me. And that's what the Bible refers to as being born again. But the way that you're born again is through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It isn't by just standing up in front of a group of people and saying, Jesus is Lord. It comes when Jesus convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment by His Spirit, and you acknowledge your worthlessness without Him and your need for salvation. And you bow your heart before Him, and you ask Him to forgive you, and you receive His gift of salvation, fully cognizant that it doesn't come by works of righteousness which you've done, but because of His mercy and His grace, He saves you. And that's how you can now say, Jesus is Lord. Not just some words that you say, three words, Jesus is Lord, and, and now I can go off and do whatever it is that I want to do and still go to heaven. But no, Jesus is Lord. He, by his powerful spirit, is transforming my life. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enters into our life Paul does not want us to be ignorant of his gifts, and he's about to outline the gifts of the Spirit, gifts that we're going to take time to look at, sometimes one, sometimes two at a time. And I'm going to do as good a job as I can do to give you as thorough a teaching as I can on the gifts of the Spirit so that at the end of this portion, we can walk out and we can say, I understand, and this is the gift God has given me, and in faith, this is how I want to live for Jesus Christ. And we will see that as we continue on. That was your introduction. And we'll look at that next time we come together.